So hello and welcome back to another uh, VTT podcast session. Um, you may notice that we're one person short, so I'm joined by Will and Laura, um, but Catherine isn't with us today. Um, she's gotten tied down with other things, hasn't been able to make it, but she'll be back with us next week. Um, so today we have the pleasure of, or we had the pleasure of listening to a podcast suggestion from Laura. So I'm going to hand over to Laura to tell us all about this super interesting podcast. Thanks, Gemma. So we listened to uh, Work Life with Adam Grant. And the episode that we listened to was when work takes over your life. So it was all about work-life balance and how to set healthy boundaries. Um, one of the first concepts um, that was introduced was this idea that there's a distinction between segmenters and um, integrators. So segmenters they keep their um, work life very separate. And there's clear boundaries between work and life and integrators, there aren't really any boundaries and it's all one big fuzzy thing. So to start us off, I would really be interested in uh, finding out whether you two uh, see yourselves as more segmenters or more integrators. Maybe Gemma, you can, you can answer first. <laughs> yeah, sure. So. Um, I found it a little bit, well, it kind of determine like where I sit on the spectrum. And I think there probably is a spectrum because there's some of us who are complete segregators who can just start and leave work at the same time every day and separate the two. And there were probably some people who is completely blurred. So they could be working at two o'clock in the morning because they can't sleep <laughs> or, um, you know, there's kind of no limits between what they do. And then there's some of us in the middle. So I think I maybe sit somewhere between the middle and a segregator. So I do find it quite easy to switch off, turn my phone off, ignore work, not go back to my desk at the end of the day. Um, but there are times where I'll dip in and out. So it's not completely concrete. Hmm. What about you then, Will? I completely agree with Gemma. And I think there is a spectrum and we all sit somewhere on that line. For me, it depends on the job I'm doing. In the past, I used to work as a teacher and it was very easy for me to segment as a teacher. I would go to the office to do my lesson planning and then I would go to the classroom, I would teach and then I would go home, hang up my badge and mm -hmm. I'm out of work. And it was very easy to do that. Now I'm working in more of a creative role. And sometimes it's six o'clock at night or seven o'clock at night, even on the weekends. And Laura and I were talking about work and we're talking about all the ideas that we have. And we find it's more difficult to segment. And Laura raised an interesting point that if we did segment, it's more difficult to get interested in the work. I, th I think that's that's a really good point that it depends on the work that you are doing and it's this is the whole idea of um, the engaged workaholic and if you love your job and it almost feels like it isn't a problem when you're constantly talking about work I think on that spectrum I see myself as an integrator trying to be a segmenter um, I, I find it quite difficult sometimes to switch off um, just because I, I get really interested in um, in work um, especially now that it's a more more of a creative role um, but I'm trying to set boundaries and the way I'm trying to set boundaries is kind of having physical boundaries so I'll try to maybe put on a work shirt and I'll have my uh, my office area and when Will and I were talking about this I realized that um, I have so when um, recently we had to fill out this checklist um, about whether our workplace is appropriate for like health and safety reasons and one part of that was about the office chair and whether you had like an ergonomic chair and I have a standing desk, so I don't have an ergonomic chair because it just it doesn't fit in it and I'm standing anyway. Um, but the thought of getting a work chair made me really, really upset because then I felt like then I have this chair in my living room and it's work and I can't sit on the chair and enjoy the chair because it's it's the company's chair and I got I got really upset about that thought um, and I think it's really silly but I think that's what it was it was me trying to segment at least 
the physical space, even though mentally I'm fully integrated. <laughs> so that, that makes me think of a couple of things. So like, um, just bringing back to a point that Will said about the fact that you're both married, so you will sit at home and you'll chat about work after work. So does that make does that make segregating more difficult because because you work together or do you think that like does that play into the blurred lines of things I I think it definitely does um when we don't work at the same company we don't talk about work that much and previously I was working in software development and if I tried to speak to Will about it <laughs> I wasn't very <laughs> successful <laughs> like because, speaking to a wall <laughs> yeah so it was it was a lot easier to to segregate uh, that or to segment that um, and now I think we speak about work um, quite a bit more but we're trying to kind of like set these boundaries and some days were more successful than other days <laughs> um, I think um this kind of leads into the next topic, which was the this idea of having an engaged workaholic versus uh, an unhappy, un, uh, not alcoholic, <laughs> workaholic. <laughs> <laughs> workaholic, not alcoholic. Um, which so, is worse. <laughs> <laughs> let's, let's not dive into that topic. So um, with this engaged uh, workaholic, they, they love their job. Um, do you think that this justifies workaholic tendencies then is is this is it okay if I get really into my job is it okay if there are no boundaries and I'm working until 2 a.m in the morning well I'll let you answer first okay I think for a short period of time it's fine when I first started at VTT, I, I was in a new role. I wanted to learn as much as possible. So I spent my weekends, both Saturday and Sunday, on Udemy and Skillshare and other platforms, really trying to improve my skills. And I did this for, I think, longer than a month. And then you can start to get tired and it's nice to have a break. One thing that I really love that I find so enjoyable is taking out our camper van. Laura and I have a camper van. So if we can go away for the weekend, if we can park up in nature, preferably without signal, we can completely dis disconnect from work and we can relax. I think it's fine to spend some weekends if you want to learn, if you want to study on different courses that you don't have the time to do during work hours. I don't think that's a problem. For me, it becomes a problem if I do this consistently over an not so extended, but over a longer period of time. Yeah, so um, I guess there are some similarities for me. So the, bi the biggest challenge for me right now is that in all of the jobs I've ever had before, I've been actively discouraged from working outside of work hours, you know, like putting extra effort in and, and working overtime. But with this role, because it is learning and development, it is something creative, it is something that people can easily be passionate about. I'm certainly very passionate about learning. There is a kind of a blurred line between when you are learning for your own personal development and learning for work, because it's pretty much the same in this role. Um, but yeah, I guess it, it's challenging because like the guy Adam mentioned in the podcast, for some people, it genuinely makes them super happy to be working all the time, to be working all hours under the sun, because it's something that they're really passionate about. And it, is, it doesn't always become an issue because I think it comes down to your lifestyle. So if you do have a family and you want to be an active part of your family, then maybe you would become that unhappy workaholic because you're missing out on valuable time. But if you're a single professional and that's not the lifestyle you're looking for, then maybe it is kind of justified to be a workaholic if it makes you happy. Um, I think another um, uh, example from the podcast was that if the leadership works really long hours, that that then kind of sets this example and the expectation that the rest of the team also has to do that. Um, and I'm wondering whether this doesn't just apply to the leadership, but like, for example, if I decide one day I'm, I'm going to just work until 10 p.m. every every day, um, I'm going to put a lot of extra effort in. 
what what how does that change the expectations for the rest of the team am i doing something bad there if i put in more effort because it somehow puts pressure onto other people in the podcast they mentioned how it how it was interesting that segregators were less accepting of um what's the term that we used for people with blurred lines just remind Um, me integrator integrator that's right so segregators were less accepting of segreg of um integrators whereas integrators were far more accepting of segregators so i guess it depends on your work dynamic if you have lots of people who are segregators and one person that's an integrator then you might have a cultural issue on your hands whereas if you've got a mix and a bit of a blend and it's very flexible which is very much like vtt we're quite flexible in understanding i don't think it necessarily becomes an issue another um example that was mentioned in the podcast was um ariana Huffington, which is um, was the co-founder of the Huffington Post, and she suffered from burnout in uh, 2007, um, and uh, she self-identifies as um, as an engaged workaholic. But she now sees that if she takes time to relax and to kind of switch off a bit, she actually loves her job even more. And she has like a few tricks of how she does that with um, like an evening routine or setting an intention in the morning. Um, Do you have any tips like that? Do you do anything to kind of keep that work-life balance? Any little routines or uh, rituals that you do? Oh, I was going to let Will go. I have no, I'm being (laughs) quiet because nothing really comes to mind. I think it's more difficult when you're working virtually. So you have my separate office space here, which I only sit in when I'm working. Um, But in the morning, I open my laptop. In the design studio, we have our stand up. So our stand up, it's what work did I do yesterday? What will I work on today? And do I have any blockers that I need help for from my colleagues or manager? So I guess that can be a bit of a ritual, but apart from that, I can't really think of a strong ritual. I mentioned earlier when I stopped working, when I was teaching in person, I would take off my name tag when I came into the house and right by the door, I had a hook where I could put it and then I was home. That's kind of like the story with the firefighter who had to um, shower before he could speak to his wife because he had to like cleanse himself off of work. Yeah. No, not, not so extreme though, just taking off my name tag, but... <laughs> That's the same idea. <laughs> same yeah. idea, definitely. Yeah. I mean, mine are quite similar to um, to the ones mentioned in the podcast, which is I'm in my spare room now, um, but I used to have a separate office. So whenever I was finished at the end of the day, I'd shut the door and not reopen the door. It was a sort of closed door policy. I'm not going to go back and work after I've closed the door. Um, I have a work phone, which I, I turn off. Um, my laptop. Um, and if I would rather stay an extra half an hour or an hour late to complete all of the tasks, then come back to them at a later stage so that there is that divide. Even if I'm working a little bit later, I'm kind of dividing the time so that that part of the day is done. And now I'm on to sort of my separate life, my home life. Yeah. I think that's a very interesting point, Gemma. And I use for where I worked last as an online teacher, I had to do lesson reports. And on Friday, I could either do my lesson report straight away or I could wait until Monday and I could do them early Monday morning. If I chose to wait until Monday, all weekend I'm thinking about these lesson reports. (laughs) If I did them straight away, I could switch off better, I could relax a lot more and further enjoy my weekend. I, I think that that's a really good point if you feel like you've got tasks open that are just like looming in the background it's very difficult to switch off um something that I've been trying to do is at the end of the day to kind of write what I did and what I would have to do the next day and I noticed that when we're really really busy um and I don't actually have time to do that because I already maybe had to stay a bit longer to finish a task and then it's just getting too late so I'll just shut down the computer I find it very difficult to stop thinking about work 
if I don't get it because then I feel like oh I'm forgetting something or uh, there's this big problem maybe tomorrow whereas just the simple task of writing down okay tomorrow I'll do this this and this it, it makes it so much easier to then kind of like stop thinking about it it consolidates everything in one place for you so you then can get it out of your head and onto the paper and that's done and dusted I can worry about it another day yeah exactly hmm. um so something else um that was mentioned um in the podcast is and I think we talked about this already a little bit this always being connected um Gemma you said you just switch off your work phone so this doesn't sound like it's it's a big problem uh, for you. Um, I guess now with things like LinkedIn, it sometimes becomes a bit difficult as well to decide what is work and what isn't. Do you feel that this always being connected is causing stress for you? So this is one of the things that I struggle with because I'm quite disconnected as a person. So this I kind of have the opposite problem which is that I'm really disconnected from my friends my family because I just leave my phone turn it off not message people back for a few days I'm one of those friends um and because I like to get into projects I think they kind of mentioned it in the podcast where you can get so lost in something that you forget about time and space it's kind of like this meditative space when you get into a workflow well I kind of find that outside of work when I'm working on projects like at the allotment or I'm tending to my house plants which I'm sure you probably share with me Laura um so yeah like I have the opposite problem where I just I'm so disconnected that people are shouting at me like why are you not messaging me back why are you not talking to me and I'm literally the worst at posting on uh, Instagram or Facebook they call me Instagram basically <laughs> we're in the same club there um, <laughs> I'm, I'm, so, I'm so bad at responding to messages mm. and actually it makes me really happy when someone takes like a week to respond to one of mine because then mm. I feel less guilty about taking so long yeah me too so Will do you then feel like you struggle to disconnect or is this something that you also find easy I think I'm a massive procrastinator so a lot of the time when we have meetings I'll be in the chat box and if I think of something I will send something straight away if somebody sends me a message I either reply straight away or I reply in three weeks <laughs> so there's no in between it's not like I'll do it in two hours either straight away at this moment or it can wait yeah I'm with you on that will like I think because we're procrastinators or because we don't reply we we are quite impulsive sometimes as well like I don't know if you agree Laura but sometimes you'll message me and I'll message like that I think in work it's a bit different because we have this expectation that we need to reply but in my home life no it's either straight away or never <laughs> yeah I, I, I definitely respond to work emails and and teams messages but I think with personal stuff it's because you feel like you can wait whereas if you get a message on teams and then you just don't respond like I would be worried that like are, are you gonna think I'm not working am I really here <laughs> so I feel I feel like with with teams and an email I always respond but yeah if you send me a whatsapp message be prepared <laughs> to wait a few days <laughs> I'm always shocked when you put any messages in the WhatsApp group. <laughs> now I know why. <laughs> it takes a lot of mental energy for me to write like a message. I don't know. I think I'm, I, I think. Yeah, no. I, I, and I for me, I, I haven't put any messages in the WhatsApp group for the last couple of weeks because I broke my phone two weeks ago. I took four or five days to order a new phone. And I still haven't installed WhatsApp. <laughs> <laughs> but you've sent WhatsApp mes messages on my phone as me. So. Yeah, so I am engaged. I can get the messages from Laura. If something happens, I know what's going on. So I have this advantage, yes. <laughs> um, so going back to um, Teams messages and having to respond quickly at work, um, do you feel like this is kind of cutting your day into small pieces um, and maybe Will you can answer this first mm -hmm. um, do, do you think that you are lacking this uninterrupted deep work time because you're constantly having to read and respond to messages 
So at the virtual training team, uh, specifically in the design studio, we're a new team and we're a young team. And we're really trying to figure things out and to work in the most efficient way. At the moment, we have a daily stand-up at 9.30 in the morning. It should last for 15 minutes, but sometimes it lasts for 20 or 30 minutes. I start work at 8 a.m. And before we did stand-up, I had this uninterrupted block of time till about 11 or 11.30 when I need to answer Teams messages where I could be very productive and get a lot of work done. I think stand up the way we had it was very beneficial when we set it up because when we set it up, we were quite behind on tasks. We had workshops that needed to be delivered in a week or in a few days, and we had to communicate. We had to know whether we can help others as a team. Now it's not so important. An idea that we have is virtual co-working where we're all there co-working together, but virtually we have 25 minutes of work followed by a five minute chat or five minutes of yoga. And we're actually going to try this out for the first time tomorrow, but I think this might be a, a better replacement or a more efficient replacement to stand up. Another idea I'm very interested in, I think it was mentioned in this podcast as well, it's quiet mornings. So perhaps two or three mornings a week, we don't log into Teams, <laughs> we log in at 12 o'clock or at one o'clock in the afternoon, but the morning it's quiet, we don't have any meetings, we can just sit down and get some creative work done. Well, I really like that idea of like having an agreed quiet time in the morning. I think that's a really great way of sort of decluttering on conversations. Um, and I think there's a couple of things that spring to my mind here. So the first one is like, do we rely too much on MS Teams for communication? Because there are things that happen or that we discuss in teams that are really important. And maybe someone isn't in that day or maybe someone's been in a really important meeting and doesn't get time to catch up on the chats. Like maybe we should have more email conversation when it comes to things or topics that are super important so that we can allow people the space and the time that if they want to have a quiet morning and switch off from teams um or you know they go on do not disturb for the day that they don't feel like they're missing out you know like FOMO this new cool phrase that I'm learning um and then equally like we have that dynamic happening um in the sales team as well so one of my colleagues um she is kind of struggling to keep on top of her workload because of all the different distractions that happen through the day and all the meetings that she's getting pulled into. And it's, it's, it's interesting that after I listened to the podcast, I also saw another gentleman on um, LinkedIn who was struggling with the same issue. Um, he was struggling with all the distractions and finding that he wasn't having enough time to work and instead, he's spending most of his time meeting. Um, so it's, it's a really tricky balance to strike, I think. Um, but little things like what you've mentioned, well, as coping mechanisms, like quiet times in the mornings or do not disturb days. Or I think we're, we're starting to find that rhythm and, and, and initiate that feedback, if that makes any sense at all. I feel like I just waffled for ages. I, I agree completely. I think that makes a lot of sense, Gemma. And I think there is a fine line. One of our colleagues, uh, she used to have do not disturb for the entire day except one hour at the end of her day. So say if something was important, we want to send her a message, she won't read it until 2 p.m. And sometimes she moved this end of her day from 2 till 3 p.m. till 1 till 2 p.m. So you need to contact her between that one hour. But we are a team. It's not just about getting your work done. It's about helping others, communicating with others to help them to innovate, to create new products, to really build this rapport and work together. So I agree. I think maybe a quiet morning or one day a week where you're on do not disturb. I think that might work, but we can't do it where we're on do not disturb 95 or 95 percent of the time yeah a little bit extreme I think <laughs> that's mm. uh, I'm avoiding it mm. 
I exactly. think that it's about about shared expectations. And I don't think it works if one person is always on do not disturb and the rest of the team aren't. So if we um, started implementing, and again, we're going to, I think we're going to try some of these things out in the design studio, um, because I guess our job as well is the least people We don't really have to communicate. I mean, we have to communicate with clients sometimes and internally, but a lot less than everybody else. Um, it's very and, task heavy, though, isn't it? You know, like you've got some really important yeah. deadlines to to work towards. Um, so I can see why if you're if you get distracted even for like half a day, that's going to dis. Oh, I can't even think of the word disrupt. Mm. Um, everything that you have planned. And so probably plan making, plan making, plan making then happens if you get distracted over and over and over and then you just end up not being productive at all. Yeah, and we actually, I think only a few days ago, we finally caught up with a lot of the deadlines where we we were not necessarily rushing, but we were finishing everything just in time. And a big reason for that was that there was a period where there were just so many meetings and, um, I'm, I'm a person after a meeting, I need like five minutes to recover. Um, I'm, my brain stops working afterwards and I need to, I, I can't really get back into this deep work that quickly. And if my day gets cut into tiny pieces, then I end up really not being productive at all. And for a while we tried, um, Will and I, we tried starting work really, really early. And like starting at 6 a.m. It worked fantastic in terms of getting work done. But then I think we kind of had the same issue like that um, colleague who was on Do Not Disturb all the time that people couldn't really get a hold of us when they needed us. So again, I think if everybody says Tuesday morning, quiet time, then we all know that. And we know that then at 12, we can speak to each other again. Uh, whereas if it's just if everyone chooses their own quiet time, there might not be overlap. So I think that would yeah. be a bit problematic. Yeah, I agree, actually. I think that's a really important point. Like if we're going to have quiet time within a team, it probably makes sense on a production level to actually have it at the same time so that everybody has a productive two hours and then we can bother each other <laughs> with all of our questions and our blockers. Um, but mm -hmm. I think your idea as well about the, um, it's the Pomodoro uh, technique that you're thinking about using aren't you which mm -hmm. is one I'm familiar with with that originates from a tomato timer <laughs> yes <laughs> <laughs> so is that something that you feel like works for you Pomodoro sessions I think it would work for me if I was more project orientated so um like at home if I'm making something it's great because I'll just get lost in time take a break for like two hours so if I have that 20 minute, 25 minute stint and five minute break, it works really well on projects. But because in sales, we spend so much time on the phone and it's in meetings, it's kind of impossible because a meeting can last anywhere from 15 minutes to an hour with a client. So we can't just sort of stop 25 minutes through and <laughs> come back. It's, it's just not logistically possible, but you can kind of make it work in hour sessions. So like I'm going to have a heavy hour of working and then take a five minute break. It kind of works in that way. Yeah, I, I think that for me, it, it also it depends on what task I'm doing. Obviously, with meetings, it doesn't work. Um, but even with like more task based um, work, sometimes I feel like 25 minutes isn't enough time. And I want to do like, uh, I, I sometimes like to work in like a block of like two hours or something before I would consider taking a break, just because if I stop and then go back to it afterwards I kind of like lost track of where I am and then yeah, I you lose, lose time flow. yeah so I think um you have to be smart about which tasks you're using this technique for and uh, which tasks are better done in like more in in blocks I guess mm. yeah and I guess it doesn't have to be a solid 25 minutes does it you're right it could be do you know what I'm really into the flow of this I'm going to skip this five minute break and take 10 minutes in an hour or like yeah mm. be smart with it I think it works quite well with like if you have a lot of little tasks like writing maybe some emails or um, at the moment I have a lot of like projects open and I need to like tie up loose ends so I'll use our Pomodoro session tomorrow to do that because um, I don't need that two hour block so I think for something like that it could work uh, well. Um, 
I haven't actually heard Will's opinion um, about Pomodoro sessions. Is that something that works for you, Will? For me, it works if I can't get into flow. If I can get into flow state, if I'm very motivated to work on a specific task, I don't need Pomodoro. But there are some tasks that we enjoy less than other tasks. <laughs> I think everybody's the same. There's some tasks which, tasks which we put off or we try to cancel or try to push to other people because we don't enjoy them. I think Pomodoro, it's a great way of forcing yourself and motivating yourself to do tasks that you need to do but don't want to. I think it's great because you're there with other people as well. And perhaps they're also working on tasks which they're not very motivated to complete. It'll be really interesting to hear how you get on um, tomorrow on our next session. So you'll have to update us how you get on with your <laughs> trial sessions. <laughs> Yeah, we will do definitely. And if it does work well, we want to roll this out company wide. Mm -hmm. So it, it will be an option. Of course, we will have a group in teams and you can join it if you want to. Again, if you're in the flow state or if you're on calls and don't think it will work for you one time, it's not a problem. But if you have a task, you need to complete it. You don't want to. I think it's a great way of forcing yourself to meet your deadlines to complete these tasks. I think it's also my hope is that um, maybe eventually um, if, if I was in this co-working session, I could put myself on do not disturb and ignore all other messages. But because it's a, a meeting link and anyone can join, if something was an emergency, that person could come into that meeting and say, Laura, we need you. And uh, kind of like pull me out of uh, the co-working session. But it would kind of it would almost be like permission to ignore all messages because they know where you are. It's, it's, mm -hmm. it's almost like replicating actually being in an office in some way. Yeah. Well, um, the, the IT company that we work with, they do that, don't they? So they're constantly on Teams, on video. They're all on mute. And then if they ever need anything, they just turn themselves off mute and shout out and their co-workers help them, which I think is a wonderful idea if you've got capacity to do that, um, is, to, is to create that virtual office space um yeah so I totally mm. agree I don't know how I would feel about being on video the entire time though to be honest because I think if I'm if I'm working I might be in a really weird position <laughs> like, <laughs> <just plugged in. laughs> like sit really weirdly on my weird chair so I think I I, I would probably turn off my camera in like the focus time and then turn it back on for the breaks. I feel like otherwise I'd feel like I'm being watched a little Big bit. Big brother. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's even just tiring. Say if you're looking at the white dot on your screen or you know it's there. Uh, for me, I find it tiring and quite draining if this is on for a few hours. Uh, say Pomodoro, we want to do, do this in two hour blocks, 25 minutes on, five off, but for two hours, I think it will be quite draining for me, even if I'm not looking at the camera, just by seeing the white dot. I think it's this um, whole idea of, of Zoom fatigue, um, mm. where I, I, I can't remember what the explanation is, but I think it's something to do like you're feeling like everyone's staring at you because you're in a, in a web conference and in normal life, like you only really look at the person that's talking and not the one that's listening or something. I, I'm not sure. There's, there's an article somewhere out there that explains it much um, better. Um, Gemma, you are probably in the most meetings out of all of us. Um, <laughs> do you feel like this is something that you suffer from, Zoom fatigue? Do you feel like it's, it's quite draining for you to be in those meetings all day or are you immune to this? Yeah, I guess it's like, like it's similar to when in, in previous sales jobs, we used to do things like cold calling, which is where, you know, you get those sort of random people calling you on your telephone they're trying to sell you something and you've got no they've got no reason to call you've not given them permission to call that that's kind of what I used to do in some of my old jobs is you just pick up the phone call people see if they're interested in what you're selling and days where you would call like 50 or 60 people I'd go home and not want to talk to anyone like I'd get fatigued from talking I didn't want to talk anymore 
but I don't think I have found that when it's online virtual meetings I don't know if it's because it's more real and like with with VTT it's far more of a warm environment when you're talking to customers customers are reaching out to us rather than us kind of reaching out to them but I think if I was and and also with VTT we're very authentic so we're allowed to be our authentic selves whereas with other organizations that I've worked with before you, you kind of have to use those useful delusions like in customer service what we touched on in the previous podcast to pretend to be something that you're not um and that can be exhausting but yeah not with VTT I think uh I enjoy every meeting <laughs> I'm glad to hear that Gemma. <laughs> but I think that it's a really good point actually that um, with VTT, I think this is also something that I really enjoy that we're allowed to kind of be ourselves and we're acknowledging the fact that we're all at home. Previously, I was working as an online teacher and we had um, students complain if there was like a dog barking or something like that. And uh, one of the first things that Catherine said to me is that I should never apologize for a dog barking or if I have to go and open the door during a meeting uh, to let a dog out in the garden that that's okay and it's normal and we don't have to worry about that and that actually makes such a big difference mentally to me that I don't have to panic when there's a dog barking and I mean I'll still put myself on mute because it is annoying but I know I'm not gonna get a complaint at the end of a meeting because a dog barked so I think yeah reducing yeah. stress levels of unnecessary expectations that we're not real human beings we're all robots yeah. working <laughs> yeah yeah definitely hmm. I had one case in my last job where I spoke to a student and I spoke to him only on the telephone and during this call my call cut out twice. I lost internet two times for maybe five or six seconds. I had spoken to this student previously uh, 30 or 40 times, and every time they rate the teacher at the end of the lesson. So he gave me a green tick every time. Apart from this time, I got a red tick. <laughs> and a red tick is very unhappy because my internet dropped out twice. I called him back straight away, but he lost maybe 20 or 30 seconds of engagement. It was very interesting because the next time I spoke to this student, he complained about his internet <laughs> and he complained about he's, he's getting a new internet installed. He has problems right now. He's having problems at his company because of that. And I mentioned very briefly what happened to me last time. I didn't mention that he gave me a red tick, but it's just so he can see me as more of a human than a robot. I know when you speak to somebody on the telephone, it, sometimes it can be difficult to make this distinction and to see this person as a person uh, with feelings and with their own technical difficulties. Again, the internet, I didn't switch the box off. <laughs> it just happened. I guess in, in conclusion, sort of, a lot of these stresses at work, um, I think we're kind of putting on each other by having very high expectations, um, whether it's the expectation that you're going to answer my email at five to five, or whether it's the expectation that we all have perfect internet and no distractions. And I think we can probably all make sure or, or be mindful of what kind of expectations we have of other people or what we communicate to other people to make sure that we're not stressing each other out any more than uh, we need to. Yeah, adding additional anxieties. Absolutely. Mm. Well, mm. this was a great podcast choice. Thank you so much, Laura. Um, thank you so much for listening. Bye, guys. Bye. Bye.